he made a hundred commitments uh, on the day he took office. I went to the Socalo. Uh, I experienced that euphoria of seeing of 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 having a leftist government inaugurated into power. He made a hundred commitments. Of those, he's met more than eighty. Of them. So it's a government that's busy. It's a, it's 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 a, it's something that it's an activist government that's that's working very hard to complete what he calls the fourth transformation. What's up, everyone? This is Ramiro with Anticonquista. Anticonquista is an anti-imperialist media collective. Our content is produced by and for the Latin American and Caribbean diaspora. And today we're talking with one of our good friends, Jose Luis Granado Ceja, a good friend of ours, one of the realest actual revolutionary journalists out there right now. He's a writer and photojournalist based in Mexico City. He used to work as a staff writer at Telesur, which I used to work at as well. And he has published pieces with Mint Press News and a lot of other good, solid anti-imperialist media outlets. Uh, follow him on Twitter right now. His handle is Granado Ceja. And make sure to look at his fo His photos are amazing. He has really great photos that he takes uh, from social movements in Mexico City. And a lot of his stories focus on contemporary political issues, economic issues, social issues that are taking place, not just in Mexico, but around Latin America. And so, uh, Jose, thanks for getting on with us uh, today. How's it going out there in Mexico City? It's going pretty well. I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for such a such a nice introduction. Uh, I'm a big fan of Anticonquista, so for me, it's also quite an honor to be able to contribute my analysis and give my two cents, and hopefully it sparks a discussion, because I know that that's one of the things that uh, Anticonquista is trying to do, right, is promote that, that, that discussion, that debate that's so necessary, uh, particularly in the U.S. left, which I think has a lot of uh, contradictory opinions, a lot of confused opinions. There's a lot of things happening in the world right now. And I think in particular, being in the belly of the beast, as we say here in Latin America, it's important for us to have a really clear, uh, I think, anti-imperialist understanding of how things are. And obviously also a materialist understanding, a historical materialist understanding of, of the politics of Latin America. So, you know, it's good to be here. For sure, for sure. Yeah, thank you for getting on. And so I wanted to talk with you today about Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, who's uh, the Mexican president. He's been president for a year. He took office on December 1st of last year, and uh, he succeeded uh, Enrique Peña Nieto, who is reactionary as fuck, right wing, uh, basically a, a puppet of, of U.S. imperialism, of European capital. Um, and so AMLO took office about a year ago. And since then, a lot of things have happened. But what's interesting is that Mexico, a lot of important developments that have been going on in Mexico um, have been kind of under the surface. For example, you had a recent oil discovery, huge oil discovery in Tabasco. You have AMLO uh, looking to trade more with Latin American countries and also um, with countries within the counter hegemonic counter uh, western kind of realm like uh, china russia iran syria and so right now there's a lot of things that are going on in mexico under amlo there's a lot of division over amlo over his class nature who he represents where the country is going and so i wanted to talk to you uh jose because not only are you based in mexico but you're actually Mexican yourself. You're not a white person who's like an expert, quote unquote. You know, and there's a lot of those in Latin America um, who a lot of times because of their class background have a skewed view on things. Um, so I wanted to talk to you because, you know, you're of the people, you're there and you're doing a lot of revolutionary journalism. So what do you think about AMLO overall? Like, what do you what do you what are your thoughts on him? Yeah, absolutely. I think I mean it's important for us to to recognize that people like me, you know, my my colleagues as well, you know, we live this, right? Like we live with the consequences of this. So anything that that I'm sharing with you is because I'm a part of this. This is this is my homeland. This is my future. You know, one of the things that really made me pay a lot of attention to the discussions that were happening in the United States and Canada and 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 Western Europe was their reaction to the Bolivian coup, as if everything was just this kind of theoretical realm. And the truth is, this, this stuff is real for us, you know? And 
allow me to build on that to kind of respond to your answer, which is that uh, I understand that there are, you know, a lot of different opinions in terms of uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. Uh, I would say for me, from my experience, from what I've seen, the history of Mexico, his victory last year in the elections was monumental. I mean, I don't think it can be understated what it means to have a figure like that, somebody with a long trajectory in the Mexican left, being able to use the electoral road, electoral means to be, able to be able to win government. You know, that doesn't mean he's won power. We all know that. We understand that there are a lot of different ways that we can measure power, but he won the government. Uh, we were coming off, you know, decades of neoliberalism. You mentioned Enrique Peña Nieto. You know, it was probably the worst sexenio, which is the term we use to, to talk about the governments because they last six years, probably the worst sexenio in modern history. Just brutal in terms of, of, of uh, repression against social movements. You know, I think a lot of people in the United States are probably familiar with the disappearance of the 43 students from Ayotzinapa in 2014. You know, it's just sort of the, the worst traditions of the institutional revolutionary party of the PRI put into action once again. You know, they won this election trying to sell themselves as being something different, as like a modern progressive force, something along the lines of Emmanuel Macron in France or Justin Trudeau in Canada, uh, uh, Pete Buttigieg in the United States. <laughs> yeah, this yeah. kind of stuff that that I think uh, really, unfortunately, fooled a lot of people, I think. Uh, and, and I think Mexico really paid a really heavy price in terms of that. So going from Enrique Peña Nieto to Andres Manuel López Obrador, the difference is, is, is night and day. You know, we're talking about a government that openly declares its, its antagonism towards neoliberalism. Uh, López Obrador himself has said, we have buried neoliberalism. Neoliberalism is dead. Now, I think we should critique that. What does that actually look like on the ground? Have we actually been able to undermine the edifice in which neoliberalism has been built? Absolutely not. We're, like I said, we're talking about decades. Mexico was one of the first countries to experience structural adjustment programs. Uh, the government of uh, Miguel de la Madrid was really kind of the beginning of the, the installation of a neoliberal regime that it's going to take a long time to dismantle. But I do want to be clear that Lopez Obrador is a leftist, should be seen as such. I think it is, is worthy of international solidarity because what we're talking about is a state that is no longer being utilized to protect the interests of the elites, of capital. You know, there are certainly accommodations with capital, especially a domestic bourgeoisie. But instead of protecting those privileged groups, now the state is being used, is the, the effort is to redistribute the wealth. There's a saying that uh, is frequently used here, which is primero los pobres. So the, per, the poor should come first. And I think that's kind of that has been an, uh, in, in many ways the the guiding light of this government. So what we've seen is a move away from these wasteful, corrupt social programs that ha that have received a lot of criticism, uh, both within Mexico, but externally, because they're saying, well, you know, he's he's making too many cuts. He's cutting, uh, you know, uh, the daycares and, and health care and things like that. But actually, what we're seeing is a reorientation. You know, it's not the neoliberal austerity that I think most people are familiar with. What we're seeing is a, a, ch a, a change to direct support, uh, something like what we saw in Brazil with direct cash transfer models. So the idea is to skirt the very corrupt and inefficient bureaucracy and have that support directly reach the people. And that has been really important in terms of improving people's material lives. So people are now, you know, we have the students who receive a monthly, a monthly beca, a monthly scholarship. We have seniors who receive uh, bi-monthly uh, supports. Uh, we have Jóvenes Construyendo el Futuro, which is an opportunity for young people. You know, one of the terms that we that was heard a lot here in Mexico was ninis, ni trabajo, ni escuela. So they weren't in school, <laughs> they weren't working, you know, and that's all. They, you know, they, they would say it with, 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 with scorn, you know, all these ninis. Well, those are the people who have no options. The idea is for them to be able to find that first employment, get work, and things like that. Are these uh, are these any of these programs uh, uh, going against the fundamental capitalist model? No, but I would say that another important element and why I would describe this government as a leftist government is also what we're seeing is a reorganization of the state in the sense that there is the rescue of the state oil company Pemex. So this is something that. Lopez Obrador received an incredibly amount, a incredibly, incredibly large amount of criticism about where what he's looking for is to re-strengthen that 
state-owned company. It had been abused, it had been deliberately ne neglected in order to open up the door to privatization. Now we're talking about reinvesting in, in that state oil company. You mentioned there's a brand new oil field that was discovered and using those natural resources of the state to redistribute wealth. You know, that's the kind of language that we're talking about. So yes, there is also a very important deliberate effort to redistribute wealth. And I think that's the that's the important thing. And I would say as also as well, and I think because I think as leftists, as communists, we, we need to be critical as well. I would say I would highlight uh, some of your followers may be familiar with Pablo Gonzalez Casanova, who was pretty clear, and I think I, it's something that I take home as well, mm -hmm. is that we shouldn't be in favor or against López Obrador in absolute terms, you know? There are things that he's doing well, and those are the things that we should support. There are things that he's doing very badly. I would say that uh, acquiescing to the demands of the United States in terms of treatment of migrants has been one of the, the, the biggest stains on the first year of the López Obrador government, and that should yeah, be yeah. criticized. Uh, but other than that, you know, there are the other. He made 100 commitments uh, on the day he took office. I went to the Zócalo. Uh, I experienced that euphoria of seeing of, of of having a leftist government inaugurated into power. He made a hundred commitments. Of those, he's met more than eighty. Of them. So it's a government that's busy. It's a, it's 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 a, it's something that it's an activist government that's that's working very hard to complete what he calls the fourth transformation. And if people don't know what that means. We would say that the first transformation of Mexico was the independence movement. The second transformation was Benito Juarez and the liberals and the reform period. The third being the Mexican revolution of the early 20th century, which I remind some was the first social revolution in the world of the 20th century before the Russian revolution that had an incredible social component to it. The constitution, which is still in effect today, which they've tried to tear apart. And now what we're seeing with Lopez Obrador, the fourth transformation. So, you know, it's only a year in. Lopez Obrador himself said it's going to take at least another year for us to be able to install and make the necessary kind of structural changes so that we can't return to that neoliberal period. Yeah, I'm so glad you mentioned the uh, the transformation of Mexico because people forget uh, like Ofelia and I, uh, Ofelia, who's uh, my girlfriend and also co-editor of Anticonquista as well. We were uh, just sitting on the couch the other day and we were looking at populations by country. And Mexico is like number 10 or 11 or something like that. It's like one of the biggest countries of the world, one of the fastest growing populations. And imagine trying to get any sort of change done in a country of that size, which with such a long history of colonialism, of imperialism, trying to get any little thing done is like must be extremely hard. And I think that's what people have to understand, as you said, like leftists and communists, when analyzing AMLO or any social move or any uh, leftist uh, leader in general, is that it takes time. It's a process. You can't just as it's not like when you assume office, you get a magic wand where you're like, boom, everything that I want is going to be here exactly as it is, you know, and people have a very undialectical view a lot of times of how social movements and revolutions begin and 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 and, tra and and develop throughout history and and I feel that a lot of people on the left including a lot of people in the the Latin American left as well uh, and even some Mexican communists that I've met who have had solid uh, politics on like Venezuela and Cuba and Bolivia have had a very like cynical view of AMLO and just right off the bat have written him off, have written off Morena, uh, which is his party. And I find that really interesting because I feel that it coincides with the new strategy of imperialism where the a lot a lot of imperialists are attacking uh, anti-imperialist governments, progressive of all different varieties, right, um, with from the left. Like you, for example, you see in Iran, like for years, the CIA funded a, a so-called Maoist group in Iran called the MEK that was like, they were fucking insane. Like they would like bomb places. And, you know, I'm an atheist. I'm a communist. I'm not a Muslim. I'm not religious. Um, but I defend Iran against uh, imperialist attacks. And so I, I feel like that kind of uh, principled view of like, foreign affairs is missing from a lot of analysis, especially when it comes to AMLO, uh, where just right off the bat, he's written off as like, you know, as as revisionist or a puppet or whatever. And it's like, yeah, I, I don't agree with him on everything, you know, um, but you have to understand that we live in this material world, this material reality. 
Um, you know, there isn't some magical, you know, Maoist group in Mexico that's gonna uh, that's gonna come up and 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 take power. It's like we have to work with the actually existing institutions. And Morena happens to be one of the biggest mass organizations in Mexico that's growing right now. That's forming alliances with different communist groups, leftist groups. Um, and so I'm so glad you mentioned that. Um, going back to the point about the transformation, give us a sense of what kind of uh, things have me has Mexico gone through in the past hundred years, you know, give us a sense of like, obviously, you know, you have indigenous genocide, the Spanish colonization, um, but lead us into that, like the Mexican revolution, lead us into the, 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 the four transformations that have been taking place. Yeah, I think in order to try to understand where we are today, we have to look back at least to the Mexican Revolution. You know, the Mexican Revolution uh, gave birth to the Institutional Revolutionary Party. And, you know, there was a number of there's a tumultuous period immediately after the revolution. Uh, but I would say that in the, the, the period where it really got consolidated was the presidency of Lázaro Cárdenas. Lázaro Cárdenas was a president who wanted to commit and fulfill the social promises of the revolution, which is, we're talking about redistribution of wealth, redistribution of land. Uh, he actually promoted uh, the socialist education model, literally using those terms, and that was what was used to try to generate a social consciousness amongst the population of, of Mexico. Uh, it was probably our, our most transformative period uh, since, the, since the Mexican Revolution and, and, you know, and now. And that, unfortunately, was followed by a series of uh, what I think is, for, for, for lack of a better term, populist governments that sought to acquiesce to some of the popular demands that were being made, but while also uh, making itself, accommodating itself to the interests of transnational capital and in particular U.S. capital. Uh, without getting too much into history, I would say that that process, I think, really became uh, more accelerated in the period of the 80s, the neoliberal era, uh, which, uh, which I mentioned previously, so Miguel de la Madrid, uh, Salinas de Gotari, uh, uh, Zedillo, Fox, Benedetto Calderon, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I would say that, so it's important to bring it up because we were talking about how people are quick to write off this electoral effort to affect change in, within Mexico. And I would say that I think it's a poor reading of history. I'm glad you mentioned the different eras of colonialism and imperialism in Mexico and the history of it, because it's tied in with the importance of Mexico to the U.S. today. You know, the U.S. is the biggest empire in the world, but it's so dependent on Mexico, which is right next door. Um, and it's also where U.S. imperialism really got, got its start, you know, all the way from the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo to the annexation of indigenous and Mexican lands. And U.S. imperialism uh, was born in, a, in Mexican lands. And in my opinion, I think a socialist Mexico would be the downfall of U.S. imperialism because it would be one of the Latin American countries that would be strong enough to bring down the U.S. economy overnight. If Mexico nationalized a lot of U.S. industries, you know, for example, in Monterrey, you have a lot of uh, auto, the auto industry, like Ford and, and, and all these companies that produce cars. Um, obviously, there's a lot of uh, agriculture that the U.S. is dependent on Mexico for. Uh, labor, not to mention labor. Uh, the U.S. is extremely dependent on Mexican labor, both in Mexico and in the U.S. And so the U.S. imperialism is, is very scared of Mexico moving to the left in any way. And that's why I feel like recently in, in the past few weeks, as AMLO has been doing some really progressive stuff, like giving amnesty, uh, g allowing Evo Morales to stay uh, in Mexico after the, the fascist coup, you know, uh, allowing uh, six Ecuadorians to t take uh, amnesty in a Mexican uh, consulate in, in Ecuador. There's a lot of really cool stuff that AMLO's government has been doing uh to help the Latin American left. And I, and I feel like that's coincided with more attacks uh, from imperialist media against him. So I don't know. What do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, absolutely. And I would say that there are a lot of threats to the process of transformation of Mexico. It could go a number of ways. Uh, but I would say that the number one threat to Mexico remains U.S. imperialism. Right. That's the threat. And I think the belligerence of the United States, especially recently with the support, the outright support 
and the backing of the US of the US backed coup in Bolivia shows that we have not escaped the era where military coups uh, no longer take place. This is still very much a reality for the country of Latin America. That is a threat to Mexico. That is a is something that could very much undermine. It's already something that we know is happening. There are already efforts. Uh, you know, you you mentioned that the media efforts uh, just on the anniversary of Lopez Obrador's elect uh, arrival to power uh, to the government. There was a piece in the in the Washington Post by Mary Beth Sheridan that talked about how AMLO is the strongest president in decades. Some say he's too strong, you know, and that's how they that's how they plant the seeds. That's how they lay the foundation. So this is this idea that he's an authoritarian in the making, or he has authoritarian tendencies. It was literally the same exact story with Evo Morales, despite the numerous electoral victories. And let's be clear, he won that election. The election they, that the OAS tried to say was a fraud, he won that election, without a doubt. You know, uh, irregularities does not spell fraud. You know, let's talk about irregularities. Let's talk about irregularities in the US system. Does that mean that that's a fraud? Well, so. I would say that that effort to paint Lopez Obrador as an authoritarian is, is a very important strategy in undermining his very real mandate. It was only a year and a half ago that he received over 53% of the vote. We're talking about more than 32 million people who voted for his project and what he represented. And it wasn't just because they were sick of the old parties. It wasn't just because uh, Enrique Peña Nieto was the worst government in recent history, but it was because people were embracing this idea. You know, it's been a challenging first year. We talked a lot about some of the, the structural issues that the government has has been facing, some of the, the very real challenges, and yet his support remains in the 60s, 70s, and sometimes up to 80 percent support. Why does he have that kind of support? Because Mexicans are willing to afford him an incredible amount of patience, because they understand that this is a very this is a project to transform the country, to end that previous previous neoliberal period, and to inaugurate something new. You know that that patience won't last forever. But for now, we can see that people that the Mexican population, despite all of the very real challenges around security, around inequality, around corruption, which are still very present, they're still there. So the, this effort to paint him as as an, an authoritarian to return to that point, we also saw it in the Wall Street Journal, which trying to say that he was a threat. That to freedom of expression. It's the same uh, guion. It's the same kind of r like framework that they use to try to same bullshit. <laughs> exactly right. Like, let's 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 call it let's call it what it is. It's bullshit. You know, it's it's an it's an effort to undermine a democratic mandate in order to weaken him. Because you're right. Why is U.S. imperialism the biggest threat to Mexico? Because it's a threat to the interests of U.S. capital and other and transnational capital. Because you're as as we were talking about, it's not just Mexico's relationship to North America through the you know the Temec or USMCA or NAFTA 2.0, but it's also because the products that uh, that come from the from Mexico are, are are a huge part of the of the consumer consumption in the United States. The labor power that comes from Mexico is indispensable. You know, if uh, both undocumented and documented labor that comes from Mexican and Latin American hands, if that was withdrawn, the U.S. economy would collapse overnight. You know, that's how serious the threat. And so that there is a very deliberate interest. And uh, we, we talked about the Mexico acquiescing to U.S. demands on migration. It should be criticized. But we also need to recognize that relationship that Lopez Obrador has to manage. He has one of the most belligerent, unhinged presidents in modern U.S. history. That's not to say that the other ones weren't also interested in, in coups. We know Obama backed coups. We know Bush backed coups. Uh, but it's it's a very real threat right at your doorstep. And so it's been a, a very difficult balancing act in terms of trying to curry favor with an administration that's willing to do anything and also try to pursue the change. And so far, he's managed it pretty well. I mean, it's well, Lopez Obrador is one of the few presidents that Trump actually speaks well of, you know, even saying tweets, he's a man I respect. I don't know how I feel about that. It makes me uncomfortable that a man like Trump says he respects Mexico, but you know, I'm <laughs> I'm not responsible for diplomacy, right? I'm allowed to to feel that way about it. You know, it's a different balancing act for people who are who are in office. But that's that's why it's so important. And you're right, you know, uh, the winds are constantly changing. We just saw the inauguration of Fernandez in Argentina. That's huge. You know, that like you saw the program that he he uh, he announced on his first day of office. It's a total reorientation in the same way in Mexico 
was with Lopez Obrador of foreign policy, of domestic policy, of regional integration. That is a threat. You know, why is it that the traitor Lenin Moreno was so insistent on destroying UNASUR? Because he knows that UNASUR was a, a critical component of regional integration, of the region representing itself, speaking for itself. If we, UNASUR hadn't been destroyed, we wouldn't have had the OAS conducting the observation in Bolivia. It would have been them. It would have been that delegation. So that's that represents a threat next year. The, the, the presidency pro tempore of CELAC, the, the community of Latin American and Caribbean nations, goes to Mexico. We'll see what kind of, if it's going to take a, a protagonist role and try to recover the strength of that organization, that too will be seen as a threat. So it's important that, especially with the U.S. in an election period, that people talk about this issue, that we push these candidates that are trying to sell themselves as leftists, as democratic socialists. And I'm not talking about just Bernie, but, but, but Warren. You know, the, the whole debate has shifted. I think it's worth recognizing, well, you know, socialism isn't just free tuition and health care for the domestic population. If you're going to be calling yourself a socialist, it means being an anti-imperialist. And that's what we need to push people on as well. Yeah, that's such a good point. And we we got uh, some slack recently because we were calling out uh, AOC supporting the golpistas in Bolivia. And a lot of people were like, you know, they were like, oh, you guys are right wing. I'm like, how are we? We're calling her out for supporting imperialism. And that's such a I'm glad you touched on that, because not only is it uh, open starting that dialogue and conversation about what is socialism, what is, you know, uh, anti-imperialist uh, global south socialism versus uh, so what we would call social imperialism or you know, in uh, welfare for first world countries, you know, when people are like, oh, we want to be like uh, Finland and Sweden, you know, but, uh, versus like a different model. Um, and it also it has opened up the conversation about uh, what it means to uh, w w what is the role of the state, um, because there's always that ongoing debate. Um, and especially in Mexico, because I think I feel what's what's really interesting about Mexico is that there's such a long history of both communism and anarchism in Mexico. And a lot of uh, Mexican anarchists, at least from the analysis that I've seen uh, them putting out, you know, AMLO is just as bad as Peña Nieto, you know, and he's horrible and, uh, you know, he's ruining the environment. And and how do you how do you respond to that? Um, you know, people who come from that perspective, who come from a more anarchist perspective, who are like, you know, he he's not a real revolutionary and who favor more so like the sap who who um, favor more the Zapatistas. Like I, I, I like the Zapatistas a lot. They do a really amazing stuff. But I think a lot of uh, people in the in, in the U.S. and Canada, uh, in the global north, um, I think they also misunderstand a lot of what the Zapatistas represent and um, and and they weaponize them. I feel against people like AMLO who are trying to work with the already existing institutions. So how do you respond to like the anarchist critique of AMLO and the state? And also as well, how do you respond to critiques from uh, people who are more come from a more identity politics view? Like for example, like I'm Honduran, right? My family is from Honduras and there's a rising trend, unfortunately, a, a, among a lot of uh, Central American youth who uh, use this term that I, I don't agree with, the Mexican hegemony, um, who claim that somehow Mexico is like just as imperialist and bad as the U.S. and that, you know, that Mexico is like this hegemon and an evil, um, which I didn't see when there was the migrant caravan. You know, you're, there's the images of people in, 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 in Chiapas and you yourself saw that too, you know, Pete, the solidarity of people coming together. Um, and so how do you respond to like that anarchist, critique of AMLO and how do you respond to um, that like uh, Mexican uh, hegemony critique that, that has become popular, especially on Twitter? I would say, I mean, on the, on the first point, in terms of, of, of there are some anarchist groups that I don't think that we're ever going to find common ground because they are wedded to an ideology. Uh, you know, I disagree with it, but I respect it. That, that doesn't believe in using the, the, the state as a means of achieving power and a means of redistributing wealth. I think that in a country like Mexico, it, with the present scenario that is before us, that is the most effective road before us in terms of being able to deliver material improvements to people. Uh, so in, in terms of those those kinds of groups, uh, I think we, you know, we're gonna have to just respectfully disagree. But there is certainly you know, the autonomous, 
uh, groups. There are groups uh, like Frente Defensa de los Pueblos, uh, which has taken a, a left opposition to the Lopez Obrador government. And I think we need to engage with their criticism in a good faith manner. I did some investigation around a project called the Proyecto Integral Morelos. And I think they made, they raised good points. Uh, you know, they were talking about how this project, which actually Lopez Obrador himself, while he was uh, while we still kind of in opposition, he he rejected it. He was against, but now in power, he decided to to prove to to move ahead with. You know, and I think their criticism is is. You know, like I said, let's engage with it in a good faith. So what they say is that this destruction of the environment is a regressive distribution of wealth because it's going to destroy the natural wealth that exists in these lands for future generations. That's a fair point. I think it, we need to uh, be sincere about what kind of impact it's going to have. Uh, you know, it's one thing that I think we really need to learn from our indigenous brothers and sisters. They've talked about our, our, our obligation to future generations. But there's also the obligation we have to present generations, right? Uh, when we're talking about infrastructure projects uh, like the Proyecto Integral Morelos, like the Tren Maya, uh, the Tren Transismico, these, these are all mega projects that Lopez Obrador is now pushing forward. The idea is to generate wealth, utilizing the country's natural resources in order to redistribute it to the people. Now, we've seen the impact of that in other countries. Uh, I live some time in Ecuador. And, you know, that's where you and I uh, coincided for a little bit. And we saw the very real material improvements that that kind of approach can have. You know, we're talking about improved hospitals, improved schools, improved roads. And uh, roads isn't just, it means like the campesino is able to get their goods to the market. Uh, the tourist, uh, the person who owns the boutique hotel is able to receive tourists. You know, that makes a difference in people's lives. You know, I, I do think that we need to be careful and not to, again, stay in an academic realm and talk about these concepts as if there aren't people who actually are going to be able to put food on their table as a result of these policies. And, and that's kind of where I stay, uh, you know, uh, I always talk about amor infinito al pueblo, amor infinito para la clase trabajadora. So if you have this infinite love, if you care about people, you have to care for their material interests. And 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 and, I, and that for me means supporting these kinds of processes or these kinds of projects that redistribute wealth. Again, but I wouldn't so quickly write off the criticisms because there are other things that we need to take into consideration, you know, without getting too much onto a tangent, climate change is real. Who's going to pay the price for climate change? It's going to be the poor. It's going to be the campesinos. It's going to be the people who experience droughts and no longer can work their land. So we do have an obligation. I don't think that the Lopez Obrador government has been serious enough when it comes to climate change. And I think we need to amplify the voices that are talking about that. I don't think that's the conversation that's happening in Mexico. I was really critical of my experience at the, the Fridays for Future March that happened here in Mexico. You know, they were trying to emulate the, the example of what was happening with Greta Thunberg in, in Europe and, and North America, where it was young people at the front. That's fine. But at, what I saw in Mexico was a bunch of white presenting middle class kids put there by their parents. And there is a place for them. But you know who's really been leading the fight against climate change to, as land defenders, as, as water protectors? It's been indigenous people. It's been people like Samir Flores who, who, who fought to, to protect his lands and, and was killed as a result. You know, there are, there are dozens of examples of indigenous peoples who've been killed for, for, for protecting their lands. I think uh, you yourself, you said you're Honduran, Berta Cáceres, you know? We need to, those are the voices that I would rather see. I want to see pictures of them at the head of the rallies. That's a different kind of conversation we need to have, a third world kind of uh, environmental justice movement. So, so to your second point, in terms of this the, this hegemony, you know, Mexico is the largest, uh, you know, Spanish speaking country in the region. Uh, is it imperialist? You know, there are Mexicans, people like Carlos Slim, uh, you know, who export capital. I think that's probably the best definition we should use in terms of what is imperialism. That definitely there is Mexican capital that is used, is particularly in Central America, uh, less so in South America. Uh, that is a responsibility for the working classes, the international working class, to tackle and to confront. Uh, but I, I don't think that Mexico in and of itself is a hegemon. You know, we are, uh, in a way, we're in a dialectical relationship, right? So yes, in terms of our relationship vis-a-vis -vis Central America, yeah, we're the dominant country. But we are subjugated to the interests of the U.S. Uh, political class and the US, U.S. capital. So uh, I think we get we lose some of that, uh, that that perspective when we talk about Mexican hegemony. It's also something that, uh, that troubles me because I think it's something that seems to be promoted deliberately and causes, I'm not saying that 
talking about a cause of division, but it moves us away from the working class unity that I think is necessary to actually tackle the actual enemy. And when we talk about uh, Mexican, uh, the, the preponderance or the, the, the proliferation of Mexican culture in the United States, it's true. I mean, it's also because it's the largest demographic. But, you know, that in itself was a product of struggle. You know, the Chicano movements of the, of the 60s and 70s, that's what it was able for them to, to kind of carve out some space in that society. And so what I would say is that if instead of talking about how that is, let's talk about how that was able to successfully, through mass struggle, through political organization, to win some space inside the belly of the beast so that we can win more space, as opposed to to concede some of the space that exists. You know, and I, and I think that that is, uh, you know, a, a more comradely approach to to that question. Exactly. And at the end of the day, like if you and I, for example, were walking down the street, uh, streets of L.A. and a cop, a white cop where it was to pull us over, they would see us both as Mexicans or both as Central Americans. And they wouldn't give a fuck about, you know, if you're from this part. And, and I think people have to realize that. And, and I feel that uh, the reason I asked about the Mexican hegemony stuff is because I feel like that stuff like you said it like they're the imperialists are laying the groundwork for how they're going to attack a, a a strong centrally planned socialist mexican state and economy and i feel like we have to keep an eye on these things because those are the kind of things that in the future if amlo continues moving to the left continues building socialism in mexico uh, that they're going to use, for example, you know, with migrants, with Central American migrants, um, with, uh, you know, internally with indigenous groups um, and also the attacks from the left, from the anarchist and, and ultra left uh, attacks on AMLO. And I, I think a lot of people just don't understand that these things take time. There's a lot of there are so many uh, forces at work, you know, just because you're president doesn't mean, like you said, you have automatically all the power. And especially in a place like Mexico, where uh, the U.S. controlled narco uh, elites, they run the country, they run entire economies, entire states. And I would be scared as fuck to confront the narcos, you know, when you're trying to crack down on corruption, trying to crack down on violence. Um, I would be shitting my pants, to be honest with you, you know, doing that. So imagine for, for someone like AMLO who has gotten, is already being punched from so many angles, right? From the left, from the right, um, and, and also having to confront cartels and, and, and really important uh, figures. That's a lot to do. And, and even within this last year, like I, I took some notes as to like some of the things that he did within the last year, um, he said that he, he cut his salary by 60%, which no one else has done. Um, he said that he wanted, he wanted to do something like a referent, like a, a poll on his performance, like halfway into his term or something. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but, uh, I thought that was really interesting cause it's, it's like very democratic and it's consulting with the people and it's like you know what if i'm doing a shitty job like yeah you can kick me out i give you that permission so it creates a situation where he's forced to to be clean forced to put in work forced to serve the people um and we haven't seen that from a lot of latin american presidents especially uh in mexico uh he increased the minimum wage by 16.21 percent and he also, which is one of my favorite things he did, he created a truth commission to examine uh, what happened in Ayotzinapa in 2014. You know, the vicious uh, state kidnapping and, and murder, which we all know, um, you know, was carried out with the Mexican government, although they'll never admit it, um, you know, under the previous administration. Um, and so he's doing the, th these things that he's done within the past year they may seem very small to to people who are in uh, who who are inexperienced with seeing socialist movements develop around the world you know they seem like little things or they'll be like oh that's not real socialism that's state capitalism and it's like dude that takes a lot to do like i could imagine how much bullshit they gave him just him trying to do those little things um and he was able to do them which i think is cool and um you know, I, I'm so glad you mentioned that it brings up these debates within the left because the Mexican left, there's so many different perspectives on AMLO. Some people love him. Some people hate him. Uh, some people are indifferent. I've spoken to people who are just like, yeah, I don't really know. Like I just, <laughs> um, which is fine, whatever, you know, but I think the left should be studying what's going on with AMLO. 
So hypothetically, if AMLO hit you up right now and was like, I want you to advise me on my economic and political policy, what would you tell him? What would be some moves that you would suggest moving forward in the next few years? I think uh, there are two really important things that are happening, but I wish would happen faster. So the first thing would be reforms to, in order to be able to strengthen the organized working class. There's a long tradition of what we call syndicalismo charro, which is a sort of yellow unionism. Uh, and so really building an authentic, independent, mass-based working class movement in the country that was going to be able to put pressure. Uh, I would say that the party needs to be strengthened. Uh, like I said, it made this electoral turn and hasn't been able to turn back. That's a really big danger. Uh, you need a party that's mobilized, that it, that is a fighting organization that has an active base to be able to, to defend uh, the gains and the, and the proposals of, of a transformative process. And I would say that move towards uh, greater and greater state control of the key sectors of the economy. That's the kind of stuff that can happen in the first in the first term of government. I was recently viewing this interview with uh, with the vice president of the ousted vice president of Bolivia, uh, Garcia Linera, and he said that when they took office uh, around 20, 12 years ago, they the state was involved in around nine percent of the economy, and then when and most recently this year, it was upwards of forty three percent. So they'd be actually being able to control the commanding heights of the economy, the key sectors. You know, we're talking about industry, we're talking about manufacturing, we're talking about uh, natural resource extraction, gives you a lot more leverage in terms of being able to orient the economy, moving away from this dependence on uh, foreign direct investment. Uh, I think it would be really important and really lay the foundations for the kinds of social investments and redistribution of wealth uh, that it, that is necessary. So those would be the things that I think are are most necessary. Um, like I said, so we're only a year in. Uh, I talked about how the Mex so far Mexicans are have been rather patient. There have been some pretty big issues. You know, there was this uh, this botched arrest of El Chapo's son uh, in northern Mexico. Uh, although you know people were still willing to to uh, give him a lot of understanding in that situation. I think it was actually uh, a really good example of how this security policy is different. I think on the previous governments, they would have gone all out in warfare on the streets of a major city uh, in Culiacan, and that would have been uh, incredibly bloody. Instead, this government privileged the protection of life and withdrew its troops. I, I personally, if you want my personal opinion, I think that was the right call. That's the kind of thing that I want to see more of. Uh, and so we're seeing that, that, that these kinds of decisions are important. But I would say that this patience isn't inexhaustible. Material improvements to people's lives have to be delivered. People have to feel like their lives are getting better, that, that, that they have more better access to, to health care and education, uh, that, that, um, that the money that they have to pay through to taxes is actually going to be invested in things that make their lives better. Uh, security does need to be um, uh, improved. You know, the, the headlines will say that 20, 2019 was the most violent year on record, and it's true. But in previous years, violent, violence had jumped up 20 percent, 30 percent year on year. This year, relatively stayed the same. It increased by about 2%. So at least the situation has been stabilized, but it needs to be improved. And the situation, people need to be able to feel safe, you know, in the, on the streets. Uh, so that's really important. And then I think the final thing would also be we need a more vigorous politicization of society. Society needs to understand that the things that hopefully will come and improve their lives don't happen because they're a gift from God. They come because of political action and political mobilization, political decisions, that people understand that it's not just about, oh, I have more dollars in my pocket, and therefore I can access more consumer goods. Again, I keep going back to the example of Bolivia, and Bolivia shows that if you create a middle class that is depoliticized, that middle class will turn on you. And so that can't happen in Mexico, so we need to be aware that's going to happen. And also be aware of the threats of imperialism that we were talking about earlier. We need to reach out to people in the United States so that 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 uh, that there is a a bilateral relationship, not between the governments, but between peoples, so that they understand that the efforts to improve things in Mexico are actually go hand in hand with efforts to improve things for workers for workers and 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 lower income people in the United States. So just to wrap up, what message do you have for uh, Mexicanos living in the diaspora, especially in the U.S. Um, and but outside of Mexico? Uh, as as a Mexican yourself living in Mexico, uh, what message do you have for people who have just totally tuned out of politics and have become cynical of everything? 
um, or just in general to youth, Mexican youth, what message do you have for them in terms of uh, what's going on in Mexico today? Get organized, get involved, right? This is a transnational struggle. Capital is organized at the transnational level. We as workers need to be organized on that level as well. We need to show solidarity to efforts at transformations, even if you don't wholly agree with it, you know, even if you do have criticisms of some of the positions that the government has taken in this first year. I sh share those criticisms, the treatment of migrants, again, to bring that example, uh, you know, but it's through that protagonist type of participation, that protagonist democracy, that we are able to really push things in the right direction. Uh, we were talking about how winning winning elections isn't about winning power necessarily. So we had the one year anniversary of, of the government uh, coming into office. On that day, there was two counter rallies. So the opposition mobilized its people, they were able to get a few thousand. And then we had the mobilization in the Socalo, the main square of Mexico City, and it was full to the brim of supporters of the government. There's actually a joke that was going around on Twitter, which is how many, how many people does it take to fill the Socalo? Just one, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. <laughs> and so that nice. shows that that one. mobilization is critical. So when Lopez Obrador calls his supporters onto the streets and they turn out like that, and the opposition does the same thing on the same day, and they have maybe 10% of what he's able to pull, he knows that he has the support of the people. That's important. That same thing needs to happen everywhere. So when we talk about the diaspora in Mexico, get organized, get involved in, in, in organizations like Anti Conquista, get involved in media efforts to, to inform uh, you know, your, your comrades, inform your neighbors to, so that we can start to, to build the, the, the political consciousness that's gonna be necessary to be able to do that. And also understand that we need to see each other as comrades. You know, don't, uh, you know, a, a lot of the things that really troubled me was all these nuanced takes around the coup in Bolivia. There's no, you know, I'm it's complicated. Believer. Yeah, it, you know, there's, there's, there's a time and a place for criticisms, right? But that's not it. You know, when you have, you know, the gorillas breathing down your neck, burning down houses, and, you know, burning down guipalas, that's not the time for your nuanced takes, people. You know, it's a time to close ranks. It's a time to talk about how there's, if you, we don't act, there's going to be slaughter on the streets. And had it not been for the mobilization of the mass, and of working class and campesinos in Bolivia, it would have been much more brutal. We would have had rivers of blood on the streets of Bolivia. But it was thanks to that, to, to voices speaking out inside and outside. So that's the kind of stuff that, that I think is, is indispensable. And, and I hope people really take to heart uh, because this is a long struggle. You know, this has just begun. And we can't build socialism in isolation. We have to build it internationally. And so that's when we need you to participate. Cool. Thanks again, Jose Luis Granado Ceja, a writer, phone, and journalist based in Mexico City. Good friend of ours, Anti Conquista. Follow him on Twitter and IG at Granado Ceja. He has beautiful pictures from Mexico. Uh, he used to write for Telesur. He writes uh, also for a few different outlets. He's published in Mint Press and a few other places. Uh, great stuff. Thank you again, Jose. Uh, we definitely got to have you on again to keep talking about Mexico and AMLO. And make sure to follow Anticonquista uh, at Anticonquista. We're an anti-imperialist media collective. Our content is produced by and for the Latin American and Caribbean diaspora. It's people like us. You know, there's no white experts here getting paid 100K from the Ford Foundation. It's us. It's our people talking for ourselves about our, our issues from a revolutionary communist perspective. Um, so thanks again, you know, for following Anticonquista. Make sure to follow... Jose Luis Granado Ceja. Peace out. Uh, love you all. Take care.